Jesus Christ begins what is entitled the Sermon on the Mount, and the first several verses are entitled the Beatitudes, or we are calling this series the Blessed Life. And Jesus, in teaching on that, is using a term when he says blessed that has to do not only with future blessing, but the very fact that you're blessed right now to have these promises and these commitments from the Lord. And so in chapter 5, I love verse 2, so I often read it. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, then down to verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I don't know if you've ever enjoyed reading a series of stories about some particular theme or some particular hero or individual. Growing up, I loved to read, in fact, I'll be honest, I still do, I like to read the stories about King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. And there were three knights that became known as the three achievers of the Holy Grail. In other words, three knights, Sir Galahad, Sir Bors, and Sir Percival, who, according to Wikipedia, were considered to be pure in heart and to have spiritual graces, that they went out to find the Holy Grail, or what was considered the cup, that Jesus drank from at the Last Supper. And so those are part of the stories. But what always impressed me about Sir Galahad, he's always known as a knight of pure heart. In other words, a really good guy. Now, as I am reading through the Beatitudes, and I come to this verse, blessed are the pure in heart, I think, man, I'm in trouble. Because I don't think my heart is quite that pure. And it's interesting, from a biblical perspective, there's almost a tension. Because the same Bible says in Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, that the heart is deceitful and desperately sick. Then Jesus himself said, over in Matthew 15 and verse 19, out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, etc. And so I'm thinking, okay, we're supposed to be pure in heart, but it's a kind of a challenge because of our own hearts, which are often not as pure as they could be or should be. But I think we can grasp what Jesus is saying, at least to some simple degree, as we think together. And you know, I should at this point explain a little bit about what I mean by the heart. I think I've told you before, one of the humorous events of my early ministry was when I was pastoring in Los Angeles, a lady who was new in the faith came to me with great concern. Because at that time in the newspapers and on the news, they were talking about a woman whose heart had failed a human heart, and so she had had it replaced with a baboon heart. And this dear lady in the church came to me in all sincerity and said, Pastor, I'm concerned for that woman. And I said, why? She said, well, how will she ask Jesus into her heart if it's a baboon heart? I said, well, I don't think <laughs> that God is talking about our physical heart. I think what he's talking about is the inner person. Now, we can certainly get biblically technical about the inner person inside of us, so to speak, because Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. And there's probably a series of sermons on what's the difference between the heart, the soul, and the mind. But in essence, the heart is the idea here of the inside person, all right? Blessed are the pure in heart. Listen to these verses that emphasize being pure in heart throughout the scriptures. Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall dwell in his holy tabernacle? 
He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. Psalm 73, verse 1. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. 2 Timothy 2.22. So the use of flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, love, faith, and peace. With those who seek after these things, who seek the Lord from a pure heart. James 4 and verse 8. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. 1 Peter 1, 22. Having purified yourself, your souls by, a, um, by believing the truth of, that, of a, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. I'm going to need somebody to start writing my own sermon notes because I can't read them half the time. But to love from a pure heart. So the Bible has a lot to say about having a pure heart. Now, how do you and I get a pure heart when we know that our own hearts are often filled with impure thoughts, impure motives? We might look like the best Christian on the outside, but I'll bet sometimes you're sitting in church thinking, boy, I'm glad you can't see my heart. Well, here's the bad news. God does see your heart, okay? But he also knows we're human beings. But Jesus issues this challenge. Blessed are the pure in heart. How do you and I get, if we could, a pure heart? Well, first of all, I think it has to do with salvation. The Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 15 and verse 9 that God, having cleansed the hearts of the Gentiles by faith. And so God, by the blood of Jesus Christ, as it were, wipes the slate of our hearts clean. Does that mean we'll never have another impure thought? No. Does it mean that we'll never have an impure attitude? No. Does it never mean we'll feel anger or bitterness or jealousy or hatred or depression on the inside? No. What it does mean is from the eternal position, God looks at our heart as having been clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so that's where it starts. So even though you sitting here today, or I standing here today, may have the wrong kind of thoughts rolling around inside us, God sees us in Christ with that clean or pure heart. Secondly, I think there's the matter of commitment. It's interesting that James says, purify your hearts, you double-minded. And I think a pure heart carries the idea of commitment. James actually talks about that in James 4.4. 4. He says, you are, not you, but you in a general sense to whom he's writing are adulterous people. He said, because you consider yourselves connected with God, and yet you want to connect with the world and do things that don't please God. He said, don't you understand to be the friend of the world is to be the enemy of God? And it's the idea, really, to be blunt about it, of somebody who has a spouse, but then also has a girlfriend or a boyfriend. And they're not the same person, by the way. That's the idea. They're not being faithful. They're not being true. Shall we say, they're not being pure in their commitment to that relationship. So the pure in heart is the person, though sometimes feebly failing, will acknowledge and say, I want to be committed to God. And so that it motivates me to leave the things of the world. Then, I think not only salvation, not only the idea of commitment, but the idea of cleansing. You know, the other day I was noticing my counter at home and where I take out bread and all that kind of thing, and it had gotten something on it. I don't know what it was, but it didn't look right. And so I, you know, I get the, the, the uh, what do they call that? The uh, 
stuff in a sprinkle comet and, and a sponge, and boy, I wanted to clean that up. Now, we know, on the one hand, the only way we have a clean or pure heart is from the Lord, because David prayed, create within me a clean heart, O God. But on the other hand, James challenges us, purify your hands and cleanse your hearts. Or cleanse your hands and purify your hearts. And so we have a responsibility as well. Now, the idea of cleaning our hands, that's the outward. And you can go to Galatians chapter 5, and it'll give you a whole list of the works of the flesh. Everything from murder to immorality to anger, fits of anger to jealousy. All things that outwardly express themselves through our flesh. And the Bible says we're to turn away from those, be clean of those. And if we're involved in it, we need to clean up our act. On the other hand, it says purify your hearts. And that really carries with it the idea that on the inside, we need to look at it and say, boy, I may look good and be doing right on the outside, but inside. You see, that was the problem Jesus had with religious people of his day called Pharisees. They did everything right on the outside. But Jesus said, inside you are full of dead men's bones. Inside you are a cup of corruption because you have within you attitudes and thoughts that are evil and wrong. While you're looking good, you're really inside quite bad. And so the idea is that we approach the, the heart. And I'm just going to be honest with you. A verse that came to my mind was Philippians in chapter 4 and verse 8, where the Bible says, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good report, whatever things are pure, whatever things are trustworthy, etc., think on those things. And just as an example, there's a lot of people, even in churches, who have problems with pornography. And I'm just going to be honest with you. If you are struggling with pornography, that's not going to help you to have a clean heart. And so it may be a matter you need to repent and then you need to repair by maybe going to a brother or sister and say, pray with me about this because sometimes accountability is the best way to have victory. And then getting rid of anything and any opportunity to reach out to that, that would just be a one potent example of what it might be to keep your heart from being pure and what you might need to do to have that more pure heart. I think you get the idea. Salvation, commitment, cleansing, and finally, honesty. In other words, that pure heart. You know, I thought about two of the twelve apostles. The Bible says in John chapter 1, that Jesus encounters an apostle that we know as Nathaniel or Bartholomew. It seems to be the same person. And when Jesus met him in John 1, you know what he said about Nathaniel? He said, an Israelite in whom is no deceit. In other words, this guy didn't have any angles. What you saw is what you got. He was not deceitful from within. And I thought how that compares sadly with Judas Iscariot. Because the Bible says in John in chapter 12, when the woman came in and anointed the feet of Jesus with a perfume that was expensive, Judas said, hey, that money could have been spent on the poor. And John reveals he didn't care about the poor. He was a thief. He wanted the money in the bag so he could steal from it. You see, he was deceitful. Furthermore, one of the saddest verses in the entire Bible is Luke 22 and verse 48, where G Judas walks into the Garden of Gethsemane and walks up to the Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, and plants a kiss on him. And Jesus said, Judas, have you come to betray the Son of Man with a kiss? What should have been a sign of love and affection and friendship, he uses it to betray our Savior. You talk about a deceitful spirit. You talk about an impure heart. It's the idea of honesty. Have you ever had somebody say to you, be honest with me? 
And let's face it, a lot of times we're not honest with them. And we need to be. You know, I think about that honest heart. I think about sometimes I've gone to the grocery store and the clerk in counting my change has given me an extra 20. And part of me says, look at me. <laughs> I've even started toward the car. And then I thought, Tim, it's not right. And you know what? They may never have known who got that extra money until they count the drawer and the money's missing and then the clerk gets in trouble. They might never have known that I got the money, but I would and God would. You understand a pure heart? I remember one time as a pastor in Los Angeles, a young pastor, and a pastor that I greatly respected. I knew he had resigned from his church. He called me up. He said, Tim, I want to come see you. And I said, well, boy, why me? You know, I'm nobody. He said, man, I really like you. I just want to come fellowship with you. I was so excited. And he came in my study and sat down and tried to sell me insurance. <laughs> I didn't buy any insurance. But more importantly, I'll be honest with you, my heart was hurt. Because he was dishonest with me. He said, oh, I just want to come see you. Well, he wanted to try to sell me some insurance. I would have loved it much more if he just said right off the bat, Tim, I'd like to come see you. But I'm also in the insurance business now. I'd like to share with you. I'd have been fine with that. And how many times have we used a front that's false when we have a different angle on our heart? And even the idea of someone says, hey, be honest with me. How many times have you and I agreed to do something we did not want to do? And it wasn't because it had to be done. Somebody else could have done it or didn't have to be done at that time. But we give in. And the person will say, now be honest with me. Are you, really, are you really willing to do this? And, you know, we smile, but inside we are fuming. Man! I think that's being an impure heart. It's just better to say, you know what? This one's not going to work out for me. And just be honest about it. Salvation, commitment, cleansing, honesty. Blessed are the pure in heart. Why? Because they will see God. Now again, the challenge in Scripture is, Exodus chapter 33 and verse 20, God says, you can't see me and live. He did show Moses just his hinder parts, the Bible says, and Moses' face glowed for days. Jesus said, no man has seen the Father at any time. He who seen me has seen the Father. So in a sense, they saw God when they saw Jesus, but he was veiled in humanity. There are some what we call theophanies or Christophanies, uh, Christophanies pre-birth appearances of the Lord on earth. Abraham ate with the Lord. The Bible says he came to his home, his tent. The Bible says when the Hebrew children walked around in the uh, in the fiery furnace, that the Lord was there walking with them. A figure was seen even by Nebuchadnezzar, the Lord. But in his glory to see the Lord, it's not happened. But it will. Revelation and chapter 21 and verse 3. The Bible says when we get to heaven, that God himself will be their God, he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And so for the first time, brothers and sisters, when we get to glory, it's going to be a matter that we will see God. And the faith, as we sung about in that song, will be sight. I believe in God, I've preached about God, I've trusted God, I've prayed to God, I've sung about God, I've gathered with other people who believe in God, but I'm coming into a day when I shall see God. That's what Jesus said is blessed. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You know, it's a funny thing. I drive Lyft during the week, L-Y-F-T, ride sharing, and people often ask me, have you ever met any famous people? Well, I've picked up a couple of stealers that nobody knew. That's about it. 
People have asked my daughter, who is entertaining out of Branson, Missouri, oh, have you met some famous people? I don't know if she has or not. I remember probably the most famous person I ever personally met was, and if you're younger, you don't even know who this gentleman is, but Hubert Humphrey. He used to be the vice president of the United States. He actually ran for president. When he was running for president, my buddy and I, a couple of teenagers, went down to the Denver, Colorado airport because he was coming in, and we got to shake his hand. Now, we were wearing our cowboy hats back then and our boots, and they were having the 6 o'clock news, so we were waving our hats on the news. <laughs> and we're with Hubert Humphrey. I saw Bill Clinton from a distance one time. That's who that is. You know, people spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on tickets to these concerts because they want to see one of these bands in person. And usually you're up on the back row. You really need a, a telescope to see them. But wow, I saw them in person. Brothers and sisters, do you realize the joy, the thrill, the magnitude of this statement of the Savior? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Amen. That's the glory. That's the glory. And so, dear Lord Jesus, please clean my heart. And dear Lord Jesus, by your spirit, stir me, work to make my heart more pure. Blessed are the pure heart, for they shall see God. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together and sing. You know what, Jane?